My name's James Simpson. I work in the lighting department at the Royal Opera House. And um, my job is to uh, do pre-visualisation of the lighting and production elements of our shows. So um, I have a, a studio where I create 3D uh, virtual models of our stage and lighting for the lighting designer to work on. Uh, it also gets used by a lot of our uh, other technical elements as well. So it's quite a technical job. Uh, it uses quite a lot of technology. And the job gives me a lot of opportunities to see new technology and play around with it. Now this presentation actually came out of a presentation I did last year at Plaza on the future, also on uh, how we do visualisation at the Royal Opera House. And a part of that presentation that I really enjoyed was talking about um, the future of visualisation technology. It sort of appealed to everyone who uh, was there because of me as a speaker and for the audience we're all sort of quite technical people and it appealed to our geeky nature to see what's in the future and what technology is coming. It's, uh, it's quite exciting, it's a bit science fiction. So I wanted to sort of build on that idea, I wanted to look at the whole of lighting and get some ideas uh, that I can demonstrate to you based on things that we've been looking at at the Royal Opera House. Now uh, to, to generate a, a presentation like this I had to do a lot of research um, and I found some very odd things which I'm going to try and build into a story for you. Uh, it's very hard to explain the future or predict it, so I've enlisted the help of some of the uh, lighting uh, department at the Royal Opera House who have uh, embarrassed themselves by being in some videos I've created to try to demonstrate the, uh, the future technology. Uh, and I apologise for both the quality of the videos and the quality of the acting, but I can assure you that their experience doing technical work at the Opera House is much better than their acting skills. So uh, I'm going to start by talking off a bit. Oh, that was bound to happen, wasn't it? I checked this all out half an hour ago. Yes, so uh, I want to start off by talking a bit about how you predict technology. Um, we tend to try and draw a line between the past, the current, and then to extrapolate that out and say that's the present, that's where, so that's the future, that's where we're going to try and get our technology to be. Uh, and a good example of that is um, the 1960s space race where NASA was sending man uh, to, the, to, to the moon. At the time, everyone believed quite firmly that in the future, by now, we'd be living on Mars and drinking asteroid juice. It was just the way that technology had to go because that was what they experienced at the time. Um, they could never have predicted the internet or social networking, two things that are completely unpredictable and revolutionised the entire world. We just have to look at how the Middle East rose up last spring. Um, largely because of uh, social networking and its experiences that it has with them. So we can't really predict the future. Uh, something I saw in the paper today, I don't know if anyone picked up today's Metro, uh, on page 31, there's some postcards from the 19th century uh, of predictions of today's uh, technology. And I had to see if you can pick one of these up on your way home. I, if I'd seen it earlier, I'd have scanned it in and put it in. But they've got a whale guiding a bus on underwater tours. That's what they thought modern technology was going to be in the 19th century. So we have no idea how to predict the future. In our own industry, predicting the future is, uh, never, would have, never would have led us to LEDs where we are now. We actually should look at our entire history in the theatre and be very proud of it. Tungsten, as a, as a technology, has gone through some massive technological changes. About every 20 years or so, we went from a, a 500 watt pattern 23 we doubled that and quadrupled it to 1K and 2K SIL 30s. Then we quartered it again, or halved it, with the, with the Source 4 by using high efficient optics and high efficient lamps. And it's only sort of in the last 10, 15 years that we've, we've explored new technologies in our lighting, in our lamps and our, our luminaires. Now, even uh, at this show, we're seeing still more developments in tungsten technology. Uh, on the ETC stand, you may have seen it already, uh, is a 115 volt uh, external dimmer that operates a 115 volt lamp, which is now more efficient than some of the LEDs on the market. So even now, tungsten is pushing the boundaries and we can't stop uh, our own theatrical technology uh, changing so quickly. But we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't look at our entire history in, of technology in theatre and assume that it's all happened in the last 15 years. We've had great, great history of uh, changing our technology around. Now, a great analogy that I like to use when I'm trying to explain the future is the film Back to the Future. And of all the films that tried to do a bit of sci-fi, uh, this is the most relevant at the moment because it predicted uh, what life was going to be like in 2015, which is only a few years away. So it went back in time to 1955. It was filmed in 1985. 
and it predicted 19, uh, sorry, 2015. So what sort of things did they predict that we would have now? This is my favourite example. It's a skateboard. They had one in 1955, they had one in 1985. So what's it going to be like in 2015? Well, obviously, it must be a hoverboard. And surely, we all have hoverboards, don't we? No, we don't. It's completely misjudged, the level of technology change. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm building myself down here so that you don't start thinking what I'm going to suggest is going to happen. And you're not going to come back to me in, in 20 years' time and say, well, you said that they were going to have this, and, I don't, and it's not. Um, we're just predicting some ideas here. We're just trying to create some ideas out of technology that we can see in other markets and other industries. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you to the future. This is our, us journeying. It's now 2030, so you've got to imagine yourself this is the future. And we're going to take a journey following a lighting designer. His name is Robin. You may know him. He used to work at the Royal Opera House 15 years ago. And we're going to watch his journey as he goes through a production process in the modern Royal Opera House with all its new technology. So we start off at a white card meeting. It's the very first meeting where the production managers and all the, uh, all, the, all the design team come together and start to share some ideas. They sit around a table and they bring along their pads with them. Now, I'm not referring to, to iPads, who knows what they're called in the future, but just imagine those square touchscreen devices that were quite common in 2012. I'm calling them pads for now. They all sit around the table and they get out their pads and they start whizzing information to each other. They simply put their hand on the pad and whiz it onto the table and they can then pass it round. They all have their notes and sort of ideas and things they want to bring to the meeting. So the director sits there and says, oh, I've got to tell you, I've moved the set in the rehearsal room. And they all shake their heads, oh, he's moved the set again. And they want to have a look at this and see, has it made a difference? Has it made any changes that they need to be aware of? So the production manager turns to his CAD assistant and says, right, can we, can we see the drawing, please? Now, gone are the days when you have a large piece of paper. Now we, we have a look at it on, the, on the, the table. The table converts into a touch screen with a, with a TV screen built, built over the entire thing. This means that people can touch and play and have a look at uh, models just with their, with their fingers. So the designer, or sort of the director, grabs a bit of set in question, it highlights, and he drags it to where it should be on his CAD plan. So they all have a look at it and go, well, we, we can't really tell if that's if that's made a difference to anything, we need to be a bit more thorough. So um, we'll load up the 3D model. So they load a 3D model up as well. Now, the 3D model is referenced into the 2D CAD plan. So the change that's just been made in the CAD plan is simultaneously updated into the 3D model. Of course, by this stage, everything's done in 3D. It's quite common to look at things in 3D. So they can have a look at sight lines and make sure things are still working correctly. They can make sure that uh, you know, the audience aren't seeing backstage and that everything works okay. So yes, fine, we're happy with that. The director did a good job moving that piece of set. But then Robin, our lighting designer, goes, well, hang on, you know, what about the lighting? That could have had a serious effect on my flyby positions. So he loads up his model, he whizzes it off his pad and onto the plan, it overlays perfectly on the 3D model because they're all consistent with each other. And he goes, yes, I was right, I need to move my flybar. So they make a change to the flybar position and they hit update and they say, well, we're all happy with that, fine. So when they save this file, suddenly, Everyone that's involved in that production gets a little update, either on their pad or their PCs or whatever medium they're using to work. And they will see a little update saying, the set's been moved, it's moved this far, this is who moved it, this is why it was changed. The computer automatically works out why these updates are necessary and makes sure that everyone that's involved in the production gets that information. So no one's ever working on old plans. Getting dangerously close to the edge of the stage here, should be careful, shouldn't I? So, suddenly everyone's communicated all the, all the latest information. That's a wonderful new tool that's come about. But now it's time to start doing some plotting. The designer's happy that he's, he's ready to start creating some lighting effects. So he goes to his pre-visualisation studio, which in this day and age every major production house has. So he goes and sits in this room with his board up. Of course, the lighting designer actually has control of the lights. He uses his hands to move and manipulate the images of the, of the beams. Uh, he's putting shutter cuts in, he's changing iris positions, he's moving lights, all by using his hands. Now, the board ops role in this is to simply verify this information and save those finished lighting positions into a lighting desk so they're in the overall database. Now, uh, they've done all their focusing, they've created all their positions. They're quite happy about the amount of work they can do in pre-visualisation. So it's time to go to rehearsal. Uh, now this is a very special rehearsal because they're using a brand new facility. Um, this is a rehearsal room that's got uh, sort of white walls all around the outside and it allows the cast to be able to work with the set. 
Of course, the set's not been built yet, it hasn't been finished. It doesn't stop them because this, uh, this rehearsal room is designed to have a 3D holographic set appear in the middle of the, st the rehearsal area that you can walk around and experience. It's made entirely of light. It doesn't really exist, but it appears to scale accurately all around them. And the dancers can walk around it and experience it as if it was a, a real set, with the possible exception that they can walk straight through it. The dancing designer can also carry on working in the same way he did in pre-visualisation, because at this point an entire lighting rig has been created in 3D overhead. Um, again, it's virtual, it's not really there. Um, but it means that he can control lights in the same way he did in pre-visualisation. He can start moving the beams around with his hands, or the board op can have direct control of the lighting desk. So this allows the, the designer to start working to scale in, with all the cast around him and imagining that he's really on stage. Now, when he's looking at his model, he sees that one of the lighting bars isn't trimmed uh, very well next to the borders. You can see it. So he decides to make a change. He raises the height of his lighting bar. Now, he's already created all his focus palettes. Now, that would, once upon a time, have been a, a really annoying change to have to make. Um, but in this day and age, as that bar moves, all those focus positions maintain their same, uh, their same landings on the stage. So even though the bar's moved, the light's on it, the lights are still in the same place. So there's no need to update focuses. He's quite happy to stay where he is. So now it's time to go to stage. So Robin, our lighting designer, comes to stage for the first time with his, with his pad in hand um, and starts looking at the lighting rig. Now the pad that he has is the tool that everyone uses, they all have one on them, and it has a databasing software which allows all the different people working in the production to share um, information. So to give you some examples, he can check uh, the bar heights by either collect, clicking on a light on his plan or you can physically point the pad at a light and say, what height is that bar at? And it accesses the, the fly team's information, so their database of fly bar heights comes out and is displayed on his pad. He's able to check things like what Gobo um, loadings are in the light. He can check what, um, what DMX addresses and things are available, if, if that's important to him. The Chief Elects also has such a system. He has a pad which allows him to check the lights. Now, you know, one of the lights not working, it's a real pain. Why does that happen? Why is one of my lights not working? So he looks at his pad, selects the light in question, and because in this day and age every light is feeding information directly back to a database on a regular basis, he can check to see what the failures are. And he says, I've lost a ballast. And it automatically comes up and tells him that according to your stock, you have no spares. There's no more spares in your stock. But this supplier has some. Do you want to order one? So you click a button, a little message goes to your supplier and tells you that uh, in 10 minutes' time, the, uh, the, the part in question will be in a cab on its way to you and will be about half an hour. Now at this point, because this information has been recorded in this database, all of the, uh, all the people that relating to this, uh, this project have that information on their plan. So when the lighting designer goes to select that light and tries to focus it, it will give them a little message saying, this light's currently unavailable, it will take an hour to fix. So all that information is just constantly updated with people. It's now time for the designer to start creating some focus positions. What he does, he walks up to the edge of the stage and he puts a little spot on the floor where he wants his downstage centre spot to be. And every light in the rig can then find that light. They all know where that spot is. So this means that he only has to go around and put little laser dots where he wants all his specials to be. And every light in the rig will know where that spot is and be able to go to it. He also wants to create some shutter cuts. So he's got a bit of set he wants to trace around. So he walks up to, uh, to the set in question and he just traces around the bit of set with his laser. It's a very complicated shape, it has lots of curves and in and out angles, but it doesn't stop him from creating that shape. Once the uh, computer console has recognised it, it can load any image you want. It doesn't have to be a white light, it can be animated effects, projections, it could be uh, simple colours or gobos, because in this day and age general lighting equipment can create any imaginable number of, uh, of lighting effects. It doesn't just restrict itself to white light. So we're going to come back in time now, back to 2012. Welcome back. Hope you like the future. What I'm going to try and do now is explain how some of this technology actually is available, or it will be very soon. I'm really hoping there's lots of dazed expressions out there going, he's lost it, he's, he's tried to predict things that are completely unimaginable. I'd prefer that, to be honest, than if you sat there going, yeah, we know all that, because if you have, you can go now. I'm not going to tell you anything new. Um, so we're going to go through each element of that story and try to explain what the technology is behind it and where it's being used already. 
Now, first of all, I talked about this table where people could interact. It had a big uh, touchscreen monitor. And the sort of fiction of that is we've seen a lot of sci-fi movies or Bond films, uh, big whizzy things that you touch. You can track things forwards, you can press play buttons, and you can move images around and sweep them off the screen. Um, sounds a bit unimaginative, but actually it's, it's perfectly possible. Um, so I keep losing my thing. So basic example of this is having a, a simple table with a touchscreen in the middle of it. It's exactly the same technology as an iPad. Uh, or touchscreen monitor, just scaled up a bit bigger. Now this could have uh, USB sockets on it, or it could have wireless interactivity, so that people with pads could uh, can share information of each other. You might have seen this technology quite a lot in museums. It's uh, possible to have interactive displays where you, you can have, in this situation, a projector down on a, uh, a large screen, which either is detected via camera or via sort of a touch, uh, touch capability. Medical use, you see this quite a lot um, for people that want to see complicated images. They want to be able to scale it up, move it around and spin it. Um, it's used quite a lot by doctors. I quite like this example. This is a restaurant in Soho where the, um, the menu is interactively displayed. So rather than having a way to take your order, you, you, you click on the, on the tablecloth and it will tell you, you know, this is what food you want to order. It shows you a picture of it on the plate. And if you really don't like your tablecloth, you can change that as well. At the end of it, the waiter simply brings you your, um, your food. So it makes it a bit cheaper for restaurants to run, their, run the restaurants. Same thing for casinos. They're getting rid of their croupiers and having digital touchscreen tables. So it's exactly the same sort of technology that you have in online casinos, but applied to a, a large touchscreen. This is actually a projector projecting onto glass. Now this is more sort of technology I'd imagine being used in a, a theatre environment. This is a sketch pad on a large scale. Designer is able to actually sketch on Photoshop using a pen. Um, so you can do a lot of very high detail graphics with it. This is kind of more what I'm expecting to see um, out of a, a sort of meeting room table where people can react. Now, for those of you who don't know, before I worked at the Wall Opera House, I used to be a lighting consultant for architects. And I refer to that a couple of times because we had some technology which we wait, I think the theatre should have. And one of it is. Uh, tables such as this. You, you'd have a, a, a table sitting and all the architects would sit around it and architects like to sketch things. They like to use a pen and, and draw their notes. So they'd all be sitting there sketching out their little details and they get automatically saved and put into the database for everyone else to see. Uh, not to mention just passing around pictures or accessing CAD drawings on a large scale. So that's something that other industries are using that we should be able to benefit from. The next technology I talked about was this idea of a designer using his hands to operate um, the lighting uh, and, and moving light positions. And Robin's doing a very good job here of trying to demonstrate what these positions could be, but he knows no more about it than I do. It hasn't actually ever been created before. The technology behind it is actually uh, the Microsoft Xbox Connect system. And I'll go on to explain that a bit in a, in a second. But I want to talk a bit about lighting control systems. Because when I was doing my research, I asked a lot of people in the industry what they would like to see in the future technology. And it was almost unanimous that lighting control technology is the thing that's going in the wrong direction at the moment. Um, now, they're, they're, they're fantastic bits of kits, and the people that use them are incredibly talented. But I don't know if you're noticing it uh, the way I am, but there's more and more desks coming out and less and less people that know how to use them, especially compared to 30 years ago, where lighting consoles were just some simple faders. Almost anyone in a, in a venue could jump on a lighting desk and operate it, whereas now it's become so specialist that you actually couldn't swap out a designer on the same desk, or sort of board up on the same desk on a show. If you've already started creating your, your plot for a complicated uh, production of a lot of equipment in, you wouldn't just swap your board up out, say, you know, if the worst happened and they got ill or something worse happened. So we've actually made it so complicated, it's the most fundamental um, error we could have in a production if something goes wrong. So I'm going to touch twice on lighting control systems and how it can be improved. And I believe quite strongly in a system like this because it gives the control back to the lighting designer. Um, I'm not trying to do board ops out of their job, um, they still have a very important role, but the actual manipulating of beams will be done by the designer and not by shouting left a bit, right a bit to the, to the board op. Um, like if we get time for questions at the end, I'd be interested to hear your views on that as well. So this is the Xbox system that's being used. The reason that we have a bit of confidence in that is it could be work in a professional environment as opposed to just dancing around in front of it is because surgery are using it now for keyhole surgery. Doctors like to use it because it's actually got um, 
uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an unsterile, uh, it's a sterile environment. There's no touching keyboards and mice. It's also much more intuitive for them to work with. So you're seeing that in surgery. If surgery can use it, so can we. Now this is probably the thing you all balked at the most, was the idea of having a rehearsal room with a 3D set in the middle of it. And yes, it is quite far in the future, but actually I can prove to you that the technology exists and we could do it if you wanted to throw lots of money at it. These are some examples though of how, it's, how we can use technology to make it work. A lot of airports in the UK are using um, uh, projectors to create 2D holograms of people. Now they are actually 2D people, they're not really 3D, but from a distance you can't tell, you just see a person talking to you. It's not until you get close you realise that it's in 2D and being projected on. This, I don't know where this was, I found the picture on Google, but it's, uh, it looks like a, a large uh, lake or covered in mist or fog and projected on from three or four different angles and that creates a sort of image that appears in 3D. Um, does anyone know what this is? Anyone seen it before? It's a water screen. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a water screen uh, with like a laminate flow over it and being projected on. So not 3D at all. It looks 3D on Google. <laughs> it's the extrusion. When you get um, turbulent flow of water, it creates a mist effect. And right. What we call extrusion, which basically looks a bit like smoke when you see it in first person. Right. Yeah. Go and ask this guy at the end if you want to know more about this. So it's an extrusion uh, and apparently creates fog uh, when it comes down. Turbulence. Ah. Repeating you, yes. This is an interesting story of a rapper called Tupac. You may have heard of him. He died sadly on stage. And uh, as I understand it, his peers wanted to recreate a concert in his honour. And he wanted them to sing completely new songs that he'd never done before. So there was no, no sound of him having ever sung these songs. And there was no images of him dancing and singing these songs. So both had to be synthesised. Now, synthesising voice isn't too hard in this day and age. But recreating him on stage to look like he's really there from the audience's point of view is a bit more tricky. It's actually a very simple technology, it's a very old technology. They use Pepper's Ghost, or what I call Pepper's Ghost, although they have patented it. I don't know how you patent Pepper's Ghost. I thought it's quite a lot older than... Go on, Go on. Yeah. What usually paints is a concept of projecting through the Pepper's Ghost material onto the ground. Right. If you have a screen surface, like an LED screen on the surface of the floor, that's yeah. very much Pepper's Ghost that isn't patented. Right, so it's not yeah. patented if it's got an LED screen on the floor as opposed to being projected. So that's the difference, that's why it's not patented. So yeah, so they recreated this concert using his, um, his image on, uh, on something other than Pepper's Ghost. But from the audience's point of view, it all worked fine. It looked like he was really there in 3D. So it's just a bit of a trick of the eye, but it did work. Can you still hear me if I talk over that? I'll wait. I know, I was watching some seminars yesterday and I struggled to hear, especially at the back, for over the ambient noise, so I was trying to be aware of that today. Um, I haven't over time. This is the uh, Jaguar factory in the UK. And now, this is actually where the idea for the 3D rehearsal room comes from. Uh, if you saw my presentation last year on visualisation at the Opera House, I gave this example before, so you may have seen it. Um, what it is, it's a small room with white walls on all sides, and they're projecting on it, back projecting with 3D projectors. So the chap sitting in the middle on a car seat is wearing 3D glasses and everywhere he looks he is seeing a scale uh, 3D image of that car. So it's made out of light, he can't really touch anything obviously, but he's got a steering wheel in front of him and he can experience the relation between the steering wheel and the gear stick, he can see the dashboard, he can see the view from the rear view mirrors in the, in the back window and how it experiences as it goes around corners. So this technology is quite interesting. Now just scale this up to a room about this size and you've got yourself a rehearsal room. It does mean in this day and age that you'd have to have 3D glasses, but actually, you may not be aware of this, but you can look at 3D objects without 3D glasses. The technology does exist. The reason it's not mainstream is that you have a very, very narrow uh, viewing angle. You have to see it from about two degrees. So it doesn't make it viable for cinemas or home TVs, which is why generally we don't see 3D, um, 3D monitors without glasses. However, in the last two weeks, I've seen a, um, an article the BBC published saying they've now cracked this in the lab uh, to make about 23 degrees viewing angle. So this increase means that uh, it makes it viable technology for cinemas and home. So if you're thinking about 
buying a 3D projector or 3D monitor for your home anytime soon with glasses. Maybe just wait a couple of years, wait for it to come out without glasses. But you can see how this would make it a viable technology for a rehearsal room. You know, everyone can walk around without wearing 3D glasses and experience uh, a 3D set around them. Maybe an issue of perspectives changing when people walk around, but I'm sure that software will be developed that could, that could tackle that. So I'm not saying it does exist, I'm saying it could exist. It's, you know, the technology is there, and the way technology progresses over time, you know, maybe someone can make it work. Now, the next few things I'm going to show you don't really relate to this, but I had to put them in somewhere as great technology, um, and this is the best place I could think of. This is actually uh, 3D scanning technology in healthcare. These aren't artist impressions or computer-generated images. These are actual scans of a living person. These are scans showing bone structure, tissue structure, blood vessels, cartilage. It's not, it's not actually a skeleton. It's a real person inside there. It's a living person. It's just a, a very clever scan. Um, and this is sort of where technology is moving. It's, the other industries are investing so much money into this sort of technology. They can produce almost anything. Though anyone that's a recent parent might appreciate this one. Um, you may have even seen one, but you can now watch your baby smile inside the mother's womb. The technology like that, it always makes you wonder why we can't do anything. As soon as you can have an idea, you should be able to, to create any idea possible. Now, we talked about interactive database and the idea of having a pad with, with databases that sort of transfer information from, um, from one person to another. I want to talk about this quite a bit. I know databasing sounds like a very boring subject, but actually, a lot of other industries really use databasing as a way of managing their, uh, their businesses. Now, I used to work for architects, as I said, and they have a system called BIM, Building Information Management. And the idea of BIM is that every department contributes to a large database. So they provide 2D plans, 3D models, or just lists, whatever format is, is applicable to the situation. And all that information goes into one giant model and creates a uh, effectively the entire building finished, including every nut and bolt, every service elevator, everything is included in this model. It'll then print out a report telling you exactly what could be clashing. It'll tell you that you've got power cables interfering magnetically with telephone cables. It'll tell you you've got sprinklers running through walls. It'll give you all the information, the things that could go wrong with that building. It gives the, the architect confidence in their design. It gives the client confidence in the amount of money they're spending because everything has been accounted for. Um, now this technology is quite expensive and it requires a lot of work, but we do a lot of work and we spend a lot of money in our industry. Now wouldn't it make sense to apply a technology like that to big production, something on the scale of the opening ceremony, to be able to help us manage our costs, to help us manage our time? Our industry doesn't have the time to get things wrong, it doesn't have the money to have to spend on uh, over going over budget. So a simple technology like that, which apply correctly, could save us a lot of time and money. Now, moving on a little bit to how we use or we want to use databasing at the Royal Opera House, uh, we have a lot of stock. And at the moment, uh, you know, this, this is our well, two photos, don't really do the storeroom justice, showing how much kit we have. Um, this is all spares that's used alongside our permanent rig on the main stage. So designers can choose to use this stuff and we, uh, we bring it out when we need it. At the moment, to inventorize this, Everything has a barcode on it, which relates to the PAT test certificates. So every light has a continual PAT test uh, register. What we can't do at the moment is work out which lights are going to be used on which shows. Now, we're looking at some sort of asset tracking software, which will allow us to track exactly what's in our inventory at any time and ascertain whether or not it's needed on a show. So to give you an example, um, we have a couple of 4K HMIs in our stock, and they're used quite regularly in Opera. And because we have a repertory system where a lot of our shows overlap, you could find that one of those 4Ks is meant to be on two shows at the same time where there's an overlap. So in order to work this out, we have to go through all our spreadsheets and all the plots for all the shows in the, in the coming season, the coming year, and work out if those lights are going to clash. If they do, we then have to hire another unit in or try to find one from somewhere that can replace that, um, uh, that overlap. Now, it could be a case that over an entire year, you'd be hiring a piece of equipment so much that you might as well buy it. It's not always that easy to predict these things two or three years in the future, but by using asset tracking software, it will tell you, first of all, that you've got the clash, and it will then tell you um, how many times it might get used, and therefore if it's worth purchasing a new product rather than to keep hiring it. So technology like that is actually a cost-saving measure. It goes a little bit further than that. I mean, as I said, we, had, we have barcodes in the traditional sense, sort of the traditional shop retail barcodes. 
But you're seeing a lot of these barcodes around now, I don't know what they're called, but um, iPhones and, and pads are using them to scan uh, technology. Now, um, well, what I was thinking of is if you applied this to a V-Lite, if you have a V-Lite with a little scanner on it, you could point your pad at it, take a picture, and it will then give you the inventory of that light. And if that, if that uh, database relates to the database of your entire um, stock inventory, it can give you information about that light, such as when it was last pat tested, how long it's got until it's next pat tested. Uh, is it meant to be on a show in two weeks' time? If I was a member of the crew and I wanted to take it off the shelf, I can go along and scan it with my phone and say, is this light actually available? Oh, it's needed in 10 days. Right, I can't use that one. I'll use the one next to it. Um, it might also tell you that there's been a repeating error, something that keeps getting broken, like a shutter keeps getting stuck. So you can identify if there's a, a, a further problem with that unit that maybe will get missed because you just don't appreciate it's the same light that keeps breaking. Now, I had this new technology up here, and even on the train today, I was reading a new article about this. The technology is changing so quickly. Um, this is uh, something that the new Nokia phone has brought out, and Google is developing uh, a system called Google Glass, which is a pair of glasses that you wear. The idea is, I think it's designed for the tourist industry, you walk around the streets and these glasses or the phone will keep updating your information about what you're seeing. So you'll be looking over there and it'll say, that's a restaurant. You spin it over here and you say, well, that's the Eiffel Tower. This is when it was built. Here's some ratings for that bar over there. Now, this sort of technology could be used in theatre. It's probably a bit extreme for us, but say you're wearing some glasses and you're looking around at your rig and you'll see a light come up and it will say, you know, uh, it's got an error message on it, and you can't read the error message because it's too far away, but you'll come up on your glasses and say, you know, it's got a shutter not working. So technology like this could be applied to the whole sort of barcode scanner thing. It will sort of start to make everything a bit more interactive. This is a final element of databasing I want to talk about, and then we get on to some more interesting stuff. This is a um, moving light assistant, which has been developed by Andy Voller. You can see it on the City Theatrical stand. Uh, Rob Halliday's created a similar software called Focus Track, which you might have heard of. The idea of the software is to manage databases. So um, you take your show file out of your lighting desk, load it into this, and it will give you all the information you need to know about that show file. So you can interrogate it for presets and cues. It's good for tours. If you're taking a show on tour, we have most of our overhead rig is, over, is automated, has moving lights in it. Um, so we could look at our show file and work out that some lights are actually only ever used in one position. So we don't need to take a moving light on tour, we can take a generic. You maybe not, don't need a scroller because only one colour is used in that scroll string. So then you don't have to take a whole scroll with you, just take one colour. Um, it also allows you to create images of your um, the show. Either you can take pictures of the real thing or you can take pictures from a visualiser such as ESP Vision that we use. And it will automatically populate your database. Now what both softwares do in a slightly different way from each other, they'll communicate between the lighting desk and the camera. So one will tell the lighting desk to load up a preset, um, and then the camera will take a picture, and then it'll load another preset, picture, cue, picture, cue, picture. It'll do all your channels. So at the end of it, you have every single channel's got a picture, every single cue's got a picture, and every single preset has the groups of moving lights applied to it. So you can have a look at all of your lights uh, in any possible scenario. So that's quite good for us. Uh, in a rep system, we can use it to archive our, uh, our images of preset information. Now, what makes this software quite interesting is that it talks to LightWrite, which talks to Vectorworks, and Vectorworks talks to ESP Vision, and ESP Vision talks to our lighting desks, and this software talks to our lighting desk. And you can see where I'm going here. All the software starts to talk to each other. Now, this is what I'm getting really excited about with databasing, is the idea that every piece of software can start to share information. Now, where this is useful is if, say, a patch changes, say, uh, you know, the lighting programmer is looking at his desk and realises he's got a conflict, he'll change a patch for a unit. Now, rather than that information then having to be distributed over email or through meetings, it will simply send the updated information to other databases. So my visualization model would have the update. The crew's uh, plot sheets would have an update so they know how to address a unit. Um, all the paperwork that gets produced has the latest address. So there's never any wrong information and everyone has it instantly. It's always available to people. Um, now, all this software can do this. It's just I don't think many people have tried putting it together yet. And uh, you know, we, we try to have a look at this at our, in our spare time at the Opera House, but spare time is a loose word. We don't get much of it. And we, we, do, you know, we are trying to play around with things like this. When we get it working, we'll, we'll share it with you. We, we want to, to share this sort of uh, technology. If it can work, it can really improve the way our industry works. Now, this is something that um, you may have seen already at the show. This, I call it XYZ control. I don't know what the manufacturers call it. The idea is that the designer puts a, a spot on the stage and all the lights know where that position is. Um, 
and I'm going to try and do a very bad job now of explaining how it works and then you can go and visit the manufacturers and they'll give you a better explanation. Essentially, it puts a 3D model at the centre of your control technology. So when you're, uh, when you're on stage and you put your little spot on the stage in the centre, the software detects that spot and then says, I know exactly where it is relative to a base point. So it's one metre up and two metres to the left. Now your light is five metres up, three metres to the right and six metres to the left. So it's just a matter of mathematics then to work out you know, a bit of trigonometry what the angle the light needs to be to find that spot. Once that spot's in the model, every light in the rig can do that, providing it's a moving light, of course. So that means that when you're creating all your positions, you just go around and create your spots and they all find the position. Now, I talked about the shutter cuts as well, where the designer sort of traced his laser around uh, a piece of set. And this is the same principle. Providing that laser trace has been identified by the model, it knows exactly where that shutter cut should be. It doesn't matter what direction the light's coming from, it will maintain that shutter cut. I'll explain how to do multiple shutter cuts in a minute, um, we'll get to that. Um, but on this, if you really want to find out more, uh, Cast Lighting, uh, who make WYSIWYG, they have a demonstration of this uh, called Black Box, or Black Tracks, so they've got two systems, um, which is really interesting, you can have a look. Stage technologies have a system called Flight, which is very similar, but rather than using cameras and, and models to track the information, they're using coders built into their flying technology. Another company that have developed this, um, but I'm not showing them because they're on the naughty list for having not finished it yet, is Grand MA. And they're trying to work out a way to create this technology in their desks because they have a, a 3D model and a visualizer built into their system. Um, what it will effectively do is, you know, if you, if you change a, a flybar height, all those focuses will remain the same because it doesn't matter where that lighting position is, that light will stay in the same, same place. You know, if that's your downstage centre spot and your singer's there, they will always be there regardless of where the lights are on the rig. If you have to um, move that spot for whatever reason, there's an issue, then the lights will still find that spot. If you just update the position, they will know where the new position is so there's no need to redo all your focuses. So this is going to revolutionise lighting control and as I said before, it's going to completely change the way that designers work with lighting control technology because it gives them the power. They have a little widget, they point it at the floor and then they can, uh, they can work with it. So um, go and have a look at cast lighting, they've got the best demonstration of this system and, and see what you think. Now I had this animated gobo where we created the shutter gut, there was a, uh, a projected image built inside it. Now I'm going to talk a bit about projection, um, but I'm going to talk about it in two different ways. First of all, I'm going to talk about data projectors being used as light sources, and then I'm going to talk about light sources being used as data projectors. And there's a subtle difference, and I'll explain as I go. What I've done here is I've put 12 data projectors into our visualizer of our Opera House lighting rig and mapped it over the floor. Now, what I'm wondering is, is it better to create a gobo wash with a system like this than to have luminaires with gobos in coming in from the sides or coming straight down. Uh, now my reason for saying this is that okay, you've got some very expensive projection technology out there. It's probably one of the most expensive things you can buy in our industry. But data, data projectors you can get for as little as 60 quid now. They're incredibly cheap uh, and they're still viable light sources. Light comes out the front of them. Uh, if you want to be philosophical about it, that's all a light needs to be. But it also has a perfectly white field of uh, a white flat image, it can manipulate into any possible uh, imaginable scenario. So you could have colours, you could have gradients of colour, you could have gobos, you could have animated gobos, you could have projection. You could actually have one light creating three or four different beams. You just black out the bits you don't want. You could have red over here and pink over there. Rather than using two lights, you're using one, you're just blacking out the bit you don't need. Now there's obviously a couple of major issues at the moment with projectors. You've got the black light, you know, this issue that's a black glow coming through, and I'll talk about that in a second and there's also the noise from the fans. But if I was a, uh, you know, a small-scale fringe theatre setting up for the first time, and I was going to spend £5,000 on profile luminaires, I might decide to go and buy a cheap media server and a dozen data projectors, because actually there might be a, a better way of producing light, which is much more flexible and versatile. Um, and I'd really like you all to disagree with me and tell me why I, that wouldn't happen uh, afterwards, because I'd, I don't understand why this isn't used more. Um, it could be me being naive, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it at the end. Uh, the other technology that I'm just talking about is the idea of putting data projectors into traditional luminaires. That's the other way around. What I'm talking about here is actually a typical profile luminaire. It has a lamp housing, it has your lenses. The only difference is, is that where the shutter is, or where your gobo goes in the, in the, in the uh, focal plane, is a digital gobo. It's effectively the same thing you get in projectors. Um, but it would, uh, it would give you the opportunity to have your normal white light source 
in the traditional way, but then you can start applying your gobos digitally with JPEGs. You can have color gobos, you can have animated gobos, you can have gradients of color. Um, now, it's got the same issues as, uh, as norm projectors, and I'll go on to that in a second. But this will make a much better light source. Just as a, a typical static luminaire, rather than coming up and pushing a metal blade in, why not push an additional blade you know, for, for a shutter? Just have a, a black edge created digitally. Then you can have all your curves. You could have multiple angles. Sometimes I look at designers on our stage trying to focus around a bit of set, and you go, they just, they just need a third shutter in there somehow, just to try and make that work. Well, this sort of system could allow that to happen. And you can still create all the original effects you had before. Now, the technology behind um, a lot of the projection these days is DLP. It's not a new technology. I won't repeat what you probably already know. Um, but Texas Instruments, who uh, developed this system, are making it even better. To give you an idea, uh, DLP is a nanotechnology. It has lots of little mirrors that rotate with magnets. And it's that movement which manipulates the, the color and the image to create the, the final output. What they're trying to do is make those mirrors, I think they're going to make them almost flip over to create a complete black. So for the first time, there won't be any black glow from our projectors. It will be black. There will be no physical light coming out. So if you wanted to have a gobo, you have white light and nothing, not a black glow coming out of it. Um, so this is going to really change uh, how we use our lighting. I mean, you could have all these digital gobos and very light are talking about putting the system in their future products um, as a way of creating new, new lighting uh, looks. It could be quite exciting. But this can't come around yet. The reason this isn't being used as a viable technology is because it's missing one fundamental thing, and that's a cool but bright light source. And you all know what I'm going to say now, and I've managed to go through the entire presentation without using the words or letters LED. Now, the fact is, is that LED is our future. It's developing at such a rate that we can't avoid it as a viable technology for the future. To give you an idea, you may have all seen this slide before, but I, I quite like doing this. Um, this is how other technologies and lamps have developed in the last 100 years. Now, tungsten technology, as, as I said at the beginning, has had some very significant developments. Discharge, fluorescent, they're, they're all developing at a steady rate. Um, Low pressure sodium, or you know, the, the orange monochromatic sodium that we see in street lighting hasn't developed at all. Um, so you can sort of see how steadily but slowly the technology has progressed. This is how LEDs have progressed. The rate is just exponential, you can't stop it. And at the rate that it's increasing by 2020, which is only eight years' time, uh, it will be far, surpa uh, far surpassing all other light sources as an efficient light source. Now, I'm going to take a moment here just to explain about efficacy rather than power, because this is a chart for efficacy, which is the lumens per watt. So that's the amount of light you get out versus the power that goes in. Uh, this is the drum that I like to bang. Um, I think there's a lot of misinterpretation about LEDs in the industry, and you've got to be very careful. If you want to specify LEDs for sustainable reasons, you need to look at the lumens per watt, not the power output. I'll give you an example of something that's happened at the Opera House. We've replaced 50 watt MR16 downlights, which are quite common, with 3 watt LED downlights. Um, so that's a 47 watt power saving per luminaire. That sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Um, now, you may have seen these sort of luminaires before. They're three chips, one watt each, and you can find them on Screwfix for 15 quid. So you think you're getting a bargain and you're saving all that energy. Well, yes, you are saving energy on power terms, but the light output has actually dropped significantly. In fact, by the time you've taken one of those chips and you've put it in a luminaire with optics that decrease the output, the luminaire's got warm because it's got a badly designed heat sink, which means that the light drops instantly, and then you get a lifetime depreciation of those lumens. You're actually getting about 15 to 20 lumens per watt, which you notice is actually less than halogen, or about the same level as halogen. What's actually happened is that we've replaced our 50 watt uh, MR16 lamps with 3 watt LEDs, and they're producing as much light as if we dimmed our 50 watt LEDs down to three, sorry, 50 watt MR16s down to 3 watts. If we'd actually dim them down to the same power, the same amount of light would be coming out of them. So it's just a general uh, point for everyone that if you're, if you're looking at LEDs, look, really look into it. Don't just uh, take it at face value and go, oh, we're saving, we're saving energy. There is a, an efficiency that you've got to be looking at as well. Now I'm going to talk now about another, oh, I'll drop my, my notes earlier, talk about another technology which you may have all heard of, but haven't ever actually heard much or the facts about. Now, this is plasma. Has everyone heard of plasma before? It's a term that gets knocked around. Um, 
I, I heard about it and I want to talk about this presentation about reading the facts. It wasn't until I just started doing some research and I thought, why aren't we using this technology more? It's perfect for us. It's got everything we need in a light source. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some ideas. So first of all, um, its efficiency is 90 lumens per system watt. So that means it's way above where LEDs are even expected to be in the next sort of five, six years. Um, and that system watt, so that means that there's no losses from the ballast, which isn't taken into consideration with LEDs when you're doing a calculation. And the power factor, uh, power factor correction has been uh, considered as well there, so that's something else that's often overlooked. It has a very small light source, it's very, very small, which means that optically it's a beautiful beam. It's very flat, it's very clear, um, but efficiently um, it means that the reflector can, co can collect more of the light. It's not often appreciated that the larger your light source or the lamp, the more of its own light it absorbs before it gets out of the reflector. So this being a very small light source means that we can have a, um, uh, effectively double the number of luminaires that you need to have an equivalent light source. So you'd have to have twice as many LEDs to get the same amount of light as one luminaire here. So that 90 lumens per system watt suddenly more like 180. So that's even beyond where LEDs are predicted to be in 30 years time in terms of the efficiency. If efficiency isn't what you're interested in, how about this? The luma maintenance go, only goes down to 90% after 25,000 hours. 25,000 hours being the useful life of most LEDs. LEDs will go down to about 70% almost instantly as soon as you turn them on. I'm talking about the, the, the drop in intensity when they, uh, they've had a, a long use. And we're constantly swapping our, our luminaires out or our lamps out at the Opera House to great expense because designers see different intensities coming out of their beams and they want them all to look the same. You wouldn't have to do that with this. Um, a tungsten lamp, to give you an idea, uh, drops to 50% of its intensity after 1,000 hours. So that's a very significant drop. This is 90%, so it's only a 10% drop after 25,000 hours. And 25,000 hours is a very long life for a lamp. It has 80% dimming. Now, that's actually not a feature. That's a, that's a, that's a drawback. Uh, that means it'll only dim down to 20% of its full intensity. And it doesn't dim instantly. It's quite slow. It has a, uh, a lag, if you will. What this means is that we don't treat it as a tungsten luminaire or an LED, we treat it as a discharge. Uh, so you'd have to have a dowser in it still. The difference is, is that when it dims, it genuinely saves power. So whatever intensity the, the, uh, the power going into it is, that's uh, a linear uh, progression against the, uh, the light output. It also has a hot restrike, so if you needed to turn it off, you can turn it straight back on again, which is something discharge can't do. Uh, now this is something I find very interesting, and this is why it's become so popular in the TV and film industry. You can scale the lamp anything from between 100 watts to 5 kilowatts. So you can have exactly the same lamp technology with the same quality of, of light coming from uh, a 100 watt lamp or a 5 kilowatt. Or you can specify your own 4,236. It's completely customizable. And in the same way, the uh, color temperature is customizable. You can choose anything between 2,000 and 12,000 K, um, which as a lamp technology is incredibly versatile. No one, no one else can tell you exactly what color temperature you're going to specify your lamp to be. Colour rendering index is 95%, which isn't as good as tungsten or daylight, but uh, it's equivalent to discharge and LEDs. And it's 80% recyclable, which is important when we're starting to consider our weed directives and, and how we're managing our, our lamps. So we're, um, we're looking at technology here, which I feel is very well suited to our industry, especially because of the quality of the light that comes out of it and the, uh, the lumen depreciation, which is something that affects our industry quite a lot. Um, I don't understand why more manufacturers aren't investing in this technology. And I think it may be because LEDs are so popular and it's simply a fashion thing. And I believe that LEDs aren't a replacement to any other light source. They're just another light source you can apply to your designs. So you can come to your, your show and you can decide if you want tungsten, if you want discharge or you want LEDs. I think plasma should be on that list as well. I think that it's a viable light source for our industry and we should be considering it seriously. I'm coming to a conclusion now and um, I've left enough time for questions hopefully. I just want to draw to the end by saying that um, the reasons why we, we need to think about the future. The future is important because as businesses we need to predict our future spending. Uh, we don't want to throw money down the drain by um, not understanding what's going to come in the future. Now for us time is money and by not predicting something that can be a time saving measure in the future we're going to be wasting money in the future. Uh, look, every industry has analysts who spend a lot of money trying to predict what's going to happen in their field. I'm not just talking about banking where you have um, people predicting where the sh stocks and shares are going to go and whether Russia's going to keep selling us oil. Every industry, whether it's from you know, computing or, or marketing, they all try to predict what the future is going to have. And we should be the same. We should be trying to understand 
how uh, technology is going to progress and how we might be using it. Now, the Opera House, you may know, had a very large refit in 1999. That's the first one in 150 years. First time we had capital investment to spend on making major changes to our infrastructure. Now, most venues are the same. We don't often get a chance to spend capital money. So when we do it, we've got to do it right. We haven't got the money to waste, and we haven't got the time to waste if it doesn't work. So I think it's very important that we all think about the future. This is only going to happen if we start working together. I don't want to say start, start's the wrong word. If we carry on working together. We're a very com community, uh, a community industry. We're very collaborative. We work together quite a lot. And we have some excellent industry bodies in the likes of ABTT, Plaza, ALD, all the different groups who bring us together and share information. Now, obviously, this is how we, we like to work at the Royal Opera House. We like to come together with ideas and try to make them happen for the benefit of ourselves and our productions and hopefully the rest of the industry. But uh, my final message to you is, Let's, let's, get on, let's get around a table and discuss some ideas. Let's work out something that we're missing and we'd like to find a solution to and look at what technology is out there and make it happen. There's some very intelligent people in our industry and I'm very lucky that a lot of them work at the Royal Opera House and can share in my passion for technology. And if we can do it, I think everyone else should have a go as well. It's great to be part of. So um, I'm now ready for your uh, interrogation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you've got 10 minutes. I uh, would we'll, we'll do a quick fire and um, if not, you can come up and find me at the end and we can have more of a discussion. So, any questions? Yeah. Sorry, do you want to wait for... Sorry, I've got a microphone for you. Um, is plasma viable from a cost point of view, yes? Yes. Um, I meant to say, I don't know anything about the costs. I couldn't find that out. Um, I, I, I got in touch with uh, Cerevision, C-E-R-A, who are the manufacturers of it in the UK. And I think they, they did the sort of the original uh, development of, of plasma in the world. And um, I get the impression that it's probably more expensive at the moment because it's not been used so widely, in the same way that LEDs are very expensive when they first came out. Um, there's no reason why it should be any more expensive than discharge technology because it's all using the same, uh, same technology, basically. It's, it's, I don't know if I, I didn't explain it. I don't know if you already know, but it's microwave emission. So there's a little chip, it's a little glass chip which has got a, um, a gas in it and it's stimulated by microwaves and that's what makes it glow. Um, so all you're actually replacing is that glass chip, the rest of it's embodied in the, in the, in the luminaire. So you're only paying for that chip when you come to replace it. So it might be expensive in a luminaire but cheap to replace. But I don't know any figures. So. Any other questions? Any thoughts on the data projector idea? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I've got some thoughts on the data projector. Okay, I, me. <laughs> quite a lot, really. How long have you got? But I mean, four, four, five thousand pounds on profiles. Um, I mean, you get quite a lot for your money, and they'd be bright. Data projectors just wouldn't achieve that with the brightness. So just and the speak media up a little bit. Uh, wouldn't achieve that with the uh, with the brightness the, the and the manipulation of it. Yeah. Well, the intensity, absolutely. Yeah. But also the way to manipulate it. I mean, even really expensive media servers, if you wanted like twenty different outputs on projectors, yes, you can do it, but you wouldn't be doing that for five grand. Spending money on the media server. So <laughs> I think it's probably out of the reach of most large theaters, let alone fringe theaters at the moment. Okay. But do, do you think that maybe in the future? Lighting control technology will have such a thing embedded in for every luminaire. Yeah, I think so may, maybe some kind of gobo system, you know, like built into the actually built into the fixture. The brightness yeah. is still the issue, but of course on the big shows, you know, where you've got tw you need the big twenty thousand lumen. lumen projectors, and yeah. they're all doing like, for example, Dancing on Ice is a good example where all the top wash and the texture is done with the lighting. Yeah, and it looks amazing. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't see fringe. The fringe theatres are still struggling to to use PowerPoint at the moment, and <laughs> need to discover keynote. Yeah, and I was, I was, uh, I was, I was thinking um, about coming into the future. <laughs> but, yeah. um, <laughs> but it's an in, but it's an interesting idea. I, I actually led a show. I'm a, a head of lighting at Rada, and we did a show. Actually, there was an article in LSI in July, right. uh, back in February. Uh, it was Stephen Sondheim Saturday night. And nobody's done it in the UK for, for, for a long time, and we did quite an interesting production. We used uh, we worked with Nigel Sadler at Green Hippo, and we did actually project most of the set and most of the scenery in a proper way. We you know we did we did we did design the set specifically to be projected on, and then did the scene tr scene transformations with the projection. Mm. I was the LD on it. And it was obviously nightmarish keeping light off the. Yeah. Projection surfaces, especially as because it was in the round as well, which was right. an interesting challenge. But uh, you could do shutter cuts around the outside. Absolutely, <laughs> we just yeah, we did manage to light the performance quite close yeah. to the flatage, and, and but we needed so many projectors and so many bright projectors, we were we were beg borrowing and stealing from everywhere. But it's but it's interesting what's happening. That's I think is very exciting the way set can be projected 
and yes. if you really work with a set designer because we've all seen it done badly it's like the emergence of moving lights 15 years ago where yes. they look like they were on self-test for most of their their lives because you know it's just horrible. well we can do spinny patterns and colors but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the production yeah. whereas i don't know if anyone saw woman in white which was a great emerging you know when you saw that some of that stuff was really good but then it did like to look, look like a really bad video game in parts of it because it just mm. wasn't blended enough and I think it's getting quite excited now because it's, it's getting blended and textured and giving us a lot more transformation opportunities. Have you, have you worked a lot at the Opera House with that at all? So have we done any... Have you done any of that at the Opera House? Yeah, we've, we've been putting... We, we, we've got a... Our sound department does our projection. I won't explain the politics of that. But, um, yeah, we, we, we're getting projections for a lot of our productions. We, it tends to be used mostly as sort of back projecting uh, onto, onto sites and things. We haven't really done anything sort of more clever you know, I, I, heard a, I was at the AOD uh, talk on the future of lighting design at Leeds uh, six months ago and they were discussing this exact topic about how projectors could get used in light sources and one of the things they were describing is how they projected up for a glass globe and, um, and they could make this thing sort of move around and it was just part of, part of the set and I thought that's quite interesting, it's an interesting use of projection um, to try to make part of the set glow as opposed to projecting onto scenery and one of, the, one of their objections was that we spent 50 years moving away from 2D scenery, you know, with the flats and getting 3D sets, and now we're projecting onto them, they have to be 2D again. So we've gone back to 2D scenography. So um, there was a bit of an objection to the idea of using projection as light sources. It needs to be collaborative. And it is interesting that, yeah. that it's ended up in the sound department <laughs> in, in most major cities. It, make, it makes sense because we're, we're but, sound, we've got yeah. a sound and broadcast department. So when projection first came along, and we, yeah. we were using it well before media servers it was the broadcast department's job to manage it because they held all the broadcast equipment. Right. It just happened to be the sound department as well because it was more relevant to them than it was to lighting. So now time's gone on. I understand the Nationals the same way. They, they've got it set yeah. up the same way. Well, and also it's a lot of work. You can't, you can't just heap it onto a lighting department because people forget just how much is involved. You're almost in another department, don't yes. you? That communicates <laughs> everyone, yeah. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. Any other questions or comments or ideas? What do people think of the, um, the light and control ideas? The idea of putting the control back into the designer. Is that, is that a bad, bad thing? Yeah, go, go on over there. So, waiting to get shot down over this one from Bald Ops. Hello. Um, I'm not a Bald Ops. Actually, I'm not a programmer because I'm a lighting designer and I work with okay. programmers. And I was really surprised to hear you say, what to that? talk about it, because what I, what I was surprised about was it felt like you didn't understand, actually, the programmers are artists. Yes. And when you work with a programmer, you work so closely and what they create is extraordinary work on the same level that a video programmer or a live sound uh, engineer it's makes working with production yeah. absolutely and so so like this idea that anyone can step in and take over their show if if your live sound engineer on a big musical went down it would be really hard for another engineer to take it over you know what i mean yeah. they do it and they do it brilliantly and that's true for programmers as well so the idea that that yeah that 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 person isn't needed or that that person's expendable or swappable i was really surprised by well, I was being careful not to say that they'd be expendable, yeah. as opposed to um, their job role would change slightly. And I, we, we had a situation where we took a production to the O2, and we wanted to use a Grand MA. Yeah. Now, the board op that we had got sick about six weeks before the production, and we couldn't find another programmer. So the entire control infrastructure fell through because we had to find somebody that could use another desk. So we're basically finding the desk that suited the programmer. Mm. And what it occurred to me was that we've got to a point where our programmers are it's, it's become such an advanced skill, and you're right, what they do is it's an art form. And in fact, I've seen a lot of designers just sitting back and watching their board op like their shows while they deal with the politics. Um, so, you know, they actually, a lot of board ops are designers in their own right. But in this situation, I, I kind of thought, well, it seems, it seems a bit backwards that the, the one weak link in a production could be the board or be the light control system and, and that person, that specific to that job. Uh, and we have six board ops at the Opera House, um, who we have an ETC EOS, and they, they have, have to be able to jump on each other's shows. They, they control their own shows, they program it up themselves, but they have to be able to swap around to take covers, cover for each other and stuff. And um, a number of times, even though they're supposed to program things in exactly the same way as each other, you see them sit at a desk and they go, 
what have they done here? Yeah, it's, it's never quite the same. Now, if, if you had a really complicated show, the idea of, I mean, I'm not a programmer, but I just, it, it would bring me out in a cold sweat, the idea of jumping on someone else's show. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. I mean, it's, it's a role that's very important. But would you not agree that as a lighting designer, you'd like a bit more control over the manipulating of the beams? Do you know what? It's not about control, actually, because when you work really closely with that person, you trust them. You trust them to but do it. But what it is, is it's yeah. more efficient. Absolutely. So if they... Right. Like, it happens all the time, actually, that yeah. your programme will say to you, do you want to just lean over and, and, and get the colour right? You know, colour mixing yeah. is a really classic one. So to be able to do that with shutter cuts and positions, it just makes so much sense, and it's yeah. brilliant technology. If it can happen, that's great. So maybe there's something in the middle there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just yeah. to respect the collaboration, yeah. respect them as artists and engineers, because that's what they are, yeah. but also to let the technology move us all forward, you know? That's really exciting. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Thank you for making it. Thank you. Anyone else want to have a go? Yes, got one at the back there. I think we've got tight rods to do one more. This will be the last one then. Uh, just to continue on from uh, the, the programming side of things, yeah. uh, where you went on to data um, uh, basing. Data basing, basing yeah. Because uh, I'm finding now, just on the, on sort of, because we're using a lot of moving lights, that you're creating an awful lot of data uh, in a show. Um, through through a lighting controller, uh, which uh, in years gone by used to uh, just control a dimmer. Now yes. it's now it's controlling anything up to uh, if you take out um, uh, media servers, can be yes. controlling anything up to 36 uh, attributes at any one time. So I think when we when we talk about programmers and lighting designers, um, the programmers are becoming the sort of the managers of data. Yes. So, so the whole idea, as you say, of, of uh, one manager being uh, um, responsible for a show and then you can bring another manager in to, to see what that manager has done mm. to, to either uh, um, continue on a production or just to relieve him for, for uh, a day of, of, of work yeah. seems a little bit sort of weird when other industries, uh, the, 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 sort of the, um, the idea that an AutoCAD uh, a um, uh, gentleman in a, in a big uh, construction uh, project would have to be stuck with that project for the four years and, and none of his personnel would ever be able to jump in and sort of uh, and continue on on his behalf. Or, so or you're saying that in, in the architecture they wouldn't be able to jump in? Yeah. They, uh, no, they, no, they no, sorry, no, they do jump they in. Do, yeah. They do, But in our industry, the whole idea of changing a programmer uh, for, for a couple of hours mm. while the other programmer has to do something or is, is unable to do something uh, is unthinkable. You, you well, it happens at the Opera House yeah. for breaks because we, we rehearse from 7.30 in the morning till 11.30 at night and it's just an, an, un, un, unmanageable for a programmer to go that long without even a lunch break. So we, we've developed a system where we can jump in and out of each other's uh, jobs so everything has to be set up the same way. So I'm not saying that the industry has to work the way we do, that we have a very specific need for that, but it does happen. But but unfortunately, because the way control has gone, a mm. lot of a lot of uh, manufacturers are actually using that as a selling point that our system controls the the system this way. Yeah. The other, so we're now getting into a, into a point where you're going to have to agree on a, a control system for your productions. I.e., the Royal Opera House goes for uh, ETC. Yeah. You might you might go on a um, on a rock and roll show, and it might be another control system. So you're 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 starting to already limits uh, your sort of um, your options by saying well programmers are now tied to certain systems rather than uh, creatively. Yeah well I mean, you, you, you learn a system don't you as a programmer and then you're you're always stuck to that system you can't be a grand and programmer and jump on an EOS if you don't know how to use EOS it doesn't transfer quite as quickly you've got to still learn the new system so yeah. But, but it's still it's still management of data. It is well I mean I see a lighting desk as a massive database you know that information is is, is, is database in a, in a computer form and it's tabulated and I mean, the EOS does a really good job of explaining how to tabulate information um, and I suppose what I'm describing here and I, the feedback's quite interesting is how um, you, know, you separate the creative part of a lighting desk to the databasing part of it and then you give the choice of the creative part to either the design or the board depending on who's got the better who's in the better position to, to manipulate it so yeah I think we've got to draw it to an end there because I've gone over by five minutes with the questions. But um, thank you very much for coming and I hope it was, uh, was interesting to you. Bye.